Good morning. I wanted to say again, because it seems like we've been here before, but it is so wonderful to do just that, isn't it? To be together. Really? Three of you? It's good to be together, y'all. I mean, this is, this is the highlight of the week, right? It's the first day of the week. What a way to start the week. I know sometimes it feels like we're ending the week, right? And tomorrow starts, but Sunday's actually the first day, uh, and that's on purpose. And we certainly look forward to this, and we appreciate you when you come and gather with us in person or online. We always look forward to that. And uh, it, it begs a question that, you know, hopefully if you're here or gathering online, that's already a positive slant to this answer. But I just have to ask, how you doing? Yeah? Good. Good. Okay. Just want to make sure. Just, you know, we wanted to check that before we go any further. But uh, the other question, what was last week? Easter, Right. Uh, we, you know, it's the reason we worship on the first day of the week is in remembrance of Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm still rejoicing because of the hope of Easter. If you, uh, before we go any further, so I'll give you a few minutes. If you have your copy of Scripture, get to Romans chapter 1 with us if you would. But, but rejoicing still in the hope of Easter, you know, so are our Orthodox friends. Today's Orthodox Easter because they uh, originally recognized a slightly different calendar than the rest of Christendom. And... Uh, uh, you know, it's just proof early on that Christians don't always agree on everything. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, continuing this week where we are, we're still in our I Am series for just a few more weeks. You see our title slide there on the screen. And, and some of you may be tracking with this. I don't know. You may remember that originally we had talked about starting a new series this week, this morning. But plans changed. Uh, you know why? I said, thank you. I had to ask the first uh the first worship service to ask, but so when I ask why, it's okay to ask why. So here's why it's because God said so. And He's the boss, right? And what He says goes. And when He leads in one direction, you do your best you can to be faithful to follow that, and He blesses. So just in case you have forgotten, the whole idea in this series is that each week we look at the different ways uh, we define ourselves and, and who we are, and then we compare those to what Scripture says, what God's Word says has to say about it. So this week's title, we're looking at quite frankly from Romans chapter 1, I am thankful. And for the record, I know it is not Thanksgiving. Uh, but, you know, being thankful should be more than just a Thursday in November. It should be a way of life. And, and I also know, I'm not confused, you know, last week we had ham, not turkey. You know, I get all that in my head. It's a southern thing. You have to have ham on Easter and somebody else has to have turkey on Thanksgiving. Because I still do ham at Thanksgiving. But uh, you're not a Southerner unless you do that, right? But we should be thankful all year round. And as we do each, each week, we, we you know, lay the groundwork with some slides. So I want to kind of do that for you and also explain, and you'll see this, our first image is, is basically our title slide. I want to share with you some of the things I'm thankful for. And that's why you'll see these images on the title slide. Well, you, you know, I, I can't go without mentioning Milo's tea, right? Uh, you, have to, you have to say that. And... and just for the record, also, another reason I'm glad and so thankful and rejoice in the hope of Easter and Easter having been last week and not now is for the first time ever I felt led this past year to, to fast for something during the Lent season. That's not a very Baptist thing, right? Uh, but from Ash Wednesday to Easter. And I fasted from Milo's tea. So anyone who I offended during that time, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but I'm so glad that now the world has tipped back on its axis correctly, and, and I can go back to enjoying that. But then also, so here we go. The three handprints, that's each of my children. I'm thankful for my, my kids. I'm proud of every one of them. Amazing. The rings, that, that's, that's significant. That's signifying Christy and I and, and you know, the, this wonderful blessing I have and who she is and what have you. Of course, top right, us. I mean, what God is doing in our midst and gathering together and worshiping and seeing God working his people and all that goes on with that. And then I'm, I'm getting into the whole Jeep thing, so that's kind of crazy. And then, of course, I can't go without mentioning the Crimson Tide because that is just God's team. And if you don't agree, there will be an altar call in a few minutes, and you can get right with God. Uh, and then, of course, my hound dog, Lulu, she owns me. I don't own her. Uh, I'm thankful for that, too. And, and the list go on, right? And, and we have that. But to continue with that, that whole idea uh, of thankfulness and where we are and the perspective of it, I also want to share some, some thanks 
our thankfulness quotes with you. So we have a few of those. So look at this first one with me and read with me. My socks may not match, but my feet are always warm. Think about that. I mean, there, there's actually some depth to this stuff, although it may sound silly. And I, I couldn't find one that said shoes, and I didn't want to misquote, so we go with that. Now look at the next. Uh, God, I love this. God gave us our relatives. Thank God we can choose our friends. Isn't that true? I love my kids. <clears throat> Hint to the morning we've had. Uh, look next. It, if a fellow isn't thankful for what he's got, he isn't likely to be thankful for what he's going to get. Right? Some, some perspective there. All right, next. I feel a very unusual sensation. If it's not indigestion, I think it must be gratitude. <laughs> and that really hits for a lot of, uh, especially those of us who grew up in Western culture in America, we don't tend to be naturally thankful. We need more about that. All right, Next. I'm thankful for laughter, except when milk comes out of my nose, and or, or Diet Coke. There's a, I got a story behind that, but I won't do that to you before lunch. Uh, what's the next one? I want to say thank you to all the people who walked into my life and made it outstanding, and all the people who walked out of my life and made it fantastic. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah, absolutely. All right, next. There's always something to be thankful for. If you can't pay your bills, you can be thankful you're not one of your creditors. <laughs> See? It's, it's about perspective. All right, next. Don't pray when it rains if you don't pray when the sun shines. That reminds me, I said first service too, it some, sounds like something Dolly Parton would say. Next. If you can't be content with what you have received, be thankful for what you have escaped. Isn't there some truth to that? Uh, what's next? Even though we can't have all we want, we ought to be thankful we don't get what we deserve. Isn't it? I mean, it's, again, thankfulness, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's about perspective. So here's a question I have for you, and this isn't really one to answer. This is one really, if you would, to just to ponder and think. If you were putting together a title slide like what you see, what would be on your title slide for thankfulness? You know, it's uh, sometimes about perspective, right? We say that all the time. And here's, here's kind of where we're going with it. Think of this. Years ago, I, I love this story. In Budapest, a man goes through his rabbi and he complains, life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? The rabbi answers, take your goat into the room with you. The, the, the man is just, he, he's, he's furious, he's incredulous, but the, the rabbi insists. He said, do as I say and come back in a week. So a week later, the man comes back even more distraught than before. He said, we can't stand it, he tells the rabbi. That goat is filthy. So the rabbi, the rabbi then tells him, he says, go home, let the goat out, and come back in a week. So a week later, an absolutely radiant, exuberant man returns to the rabbi, and he can't contain himself. He says, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of it now that there's no goat, only the nine of us. See, it's about what you look at. It's about perspective. Being thankful is so often simply that, a matter of perspective, isn't it? And here, here's the definition of thankful, showing or feeling gratitude. Because that mindset of thankfulness, it's important. It keeps our thinking along the right track when we realize that, that everything we have, we simply don't deserve. And it helps us to remember who we are in light of the rest of the world, doesn't it? And, and, and even more so, who we are in light of our Creator. All of God's Word is profitable. It serves the purpose of, of pointing us to Christ and a deeper relationship with Him. But Romans is one of the best places to start studying God's Word when you want to know more about the doctrine and, and, and understand the foundational truths of Christianity. And if you've been with us for any length of time, you probably remember that it wasn't that long ago that we were actually in a series through the book of Romans. Remember our road trip just a few months back? And that was one reason I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was ironic when I first sensed God leading in this direction and in this passage in particular. I mean, thankfulness right after Easter? I mean, remember the whole ham and turkey confusion thing? And then Romans 1 when it hadn't been that long since we were there? But remember what we said earlier God said so <laughs> and he's the boss so also remember something else we point out there is only one proper interpretation of God's word 
but often numerous applications. So as we're looking at Romans 1 this time, it's a slightly different application than than when we looked at it together a few months back. A quick review of the importance of the book. It was Martin Luther's study of the book of Romans that caused him to realize his need for personal salvation, and then that led ultimately to the Reformation. And, And I know we said it once already, but the book of Romans provides a solid foundation for establishing what we are to believe and I know it's hard to get a group of people to agree on a whole lot of stuff sometimes. And sometimes it can be even harder for a group of people in a Baptist church to agree on much more than it's time for lunch. But here's one thing I'm pretty sure we can all agree on. Life is hard and challenging and messy and tiring, and the list could go on. But it can also be glorious and fun and blessed and good if it's lived in Christ in a manner of trying our best to honor him in all we do. But Paul, as he's starting this letter to the believers at Rome, he's pointing out among so many other things in this first chapter just how important it is to be thankful for what we have in Christ. Laying the foundation for our very belief system. A a system, honestly, that seems to be getting less popular if followed faithfully. Because everyone seems to be a Christian until it gets biblical. In this first chapter, Paul's saying, and he's reminding us to be saying, I'm thankful. So let's, let's look together, let's dive together into this first chapter of Romans and see what it is that he's saying to the people then, to us now. Let's see how we can say, like Paul, I'm thankful. Because surely we can. Surely we will say, I'm thankful when we, when we notice this, watch number one, when we see the root. Look here in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Listen, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who has descended from David according to the flesh, verse 4, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom... We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see it? Remember, it's not just a greeting. This is the foundation for what Paul is saying. He's, he's, he's pointing out who he is, a servant, right? And who it is he serves, and that he is set apart for the gospel of God. He also points out who it is that he has received this grace from and not his own. This is for all of us as well, too. You know that, right? You, me, me. Any of us, ain't nothing special about us. Our job isn't to try and be special. It's to point people to the one who is. And for the record, in case you're wondering, that's Jesus Christ. It's him. think Think of a tree with their roots, and that's where we're going with this. And I know there's not a lot of, of, of big, huge trees out here. I mean, there's a few, but... You know, nothing like back east where, you know, there, there's big 50, 100-foot glorious things and all that. But no matter what, when you look at a tree, if you're not careful, you take for granted and you just don't think about the roots, do you? And the roots that are underground, think about what they're doing for those trees. And they're, 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 they're going further down. They're finding nutrition so that the tree can thrive and grow, right, and, and be healthy and be strong. But even more so, if you see a big piece of property where there's multiple trees... What a lot of times we also take for granted is that underground, those roots have all connected to one another from the, all the trees. And, and they're, they're bringing nutrition for themselves, but also for the others. And so it's this, it's this wonderful, glorious system of how God designed them so that they can grow. And that's the idea we get here when we see this. We have to stop and realize where our beginning really is, our root. It's deep down where we draw all our energy, our growth from. Ultimately, of course, it's Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. For that, we're thankful, and it's important that, 
that, that we are just that and that we keep it in perspective where we would be if we didn't have that. Because everyone seems to be a Christian until it gets biblical. Surely we will say I'm thankful when we see this. Watch number two, the reason. Look, pick up verse 8. Listen to this. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at least at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Verse 13, I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Then verse 14, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Paul realizes the reason that he's writing to the believers at Rome. They're in this together. He wants to encourage them. He wants to also draw encouragement from them. And it's because of of our faith in the one and true and only God that we are in this together despite our differences. And that is one, the core uniting factor, right? Are you, I mean, is it right that the gospel is our one uniting factor? And it should be enough, right? Jesus is the reason we are together on this. Jesus really is why we do what we do. Do you see it? Paul said it in verse 14. I am under obligation. He realizes who he is. He realizes who he serves. He realizes the calling. He's under that obligation. See, maybe uh, the best way I can explain it, and I know not everybody will get this because you're not from Alabama, but if you're from Alabama, you'll get it. If you've been spending a length of time there, you'll get it. When you first meet someone in, in Alabama, whether they're there, from there or not, it, you know, it's not really important to you, <clears throat> the first question that you ask them is not what do you do for a living, it's not, it's not where you come from. It's not who's your mama. No, the first question is Alabama or Auburn. It's either God's team, Alabama, or Satan's team. And there is no in-between, Auburn. You are near obligated to answer that question because it's serious stuff around there. Do you realize on a so much deeper level we are under obligation to each other. And it's not because of some denominational name on a sign. It's not because of comforts or present preferences. It's not as long as we agree with what the pastor or the staff team are doing. It's because of this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and not to sound too churchy or anything, but I mean, it is church, Right? That reason alone is reason enough to be thankful and keep it at the forefront of our mind. So if the gospel alone is not enough, you're welcome to leave. Because everybody's a Christian until it gets biblical. Surely we can say I'm thankful when when we, watch this, number three, when we see true righteousness. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed, Paul writes, of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I love this. Paul points out the lack of shame about the gospel. Oh, don't get me wrong, we, we may be ashamed of, of what we've done in life, but not of what Jesus has done, right? Uh, you know, I'm ashamed of somehow uh, how some Christians act sometimes. I'm ashamed of how I, I act sometimes. You know, this, this morning, 
It's one of those mornings where you wake up and you just don't really feel the best. You know, you can't really put your finger on it. You don't feel horrible, but, you know, you need to get off, you know, get back in bed and get, get out on the right side of the bed. And, you know, I had a, I had a rare headache, so I had that going on. And, 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 you know, so, you know, there was that inner bear, and I'm trying my best to contain it, you know, and, and not let it explode. I, even, I mean, I took some Tylenol before I left the house, which is rare for me and all that stuff. And, and so we, the kids and I did our weekly routine where every week we stop at Circle K and McDonald's. And we then stopped at McDonald's, we got there, and the tea wasn't right. Do you realize the significance of that? The tea wasn't right. They had, they had Something went wrong overnight with the brewer. And the, the tea out front was wrong, the tea in the back was wrong, the even backup tea in the cooler was wrong. It was too watered down, and you could see through it, and I was thinking, you people need to get right with God. And, 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 and so I'm sitting, you know, they tried to fix it, and so the whole time... You know, I'm, I'm really, I'm doing everything I can to contain myself and not, not just, you know, just get frustrated. And then I, then I remember this little voice talking, and I knew it was the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit telling me to just stop, man. Stop being you. <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it's, it's not worth this. And, 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 and it went on, and, and, and then I realized, well, I'm glad I didn't actually show this outwardly, but what craziness was it to get to that? Sometimes we're ashamed of things, right? But not the gospel. I'm ashamed of how God's people treat each other and their neighbors sometimes, but not the gospel. I'm ashamed of how God's people treat politics sometimes, but not the gospel. I, I, I'm ashamed of how, how God's people seem to have double standards in so many areas of their lives, but not the gospel. The gospel, the true gospel, needs no apology in the world. It may not be politically correct, but it's biblically correct to clearly state that without Christ, you are bound for an eternity in the absence of God's presence in a place called hell, and that through His grace, you can know Him and even better, be known by Him. True righteousness is living by faith, not works or talents or anything else. I mean, works are evidence of the grace in our lives, but not required for the grace to be given. Isn't that comforting? We can't do it on our own, but he can do it through us. Even when it doesn't seem to make sense, we live by faith. There's something worth being thankful for right there. We don't have all the answers, but our God does. Because everyone seems to be a Christian until it gets biblical. Surely we will say, I'm thankful. Watch this, number four, when we see true revelation. Look at verse 18 and listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse." You know, you know, if you're, you're like so many of us, myself, others, we get sometimes hung up on things that you know just don't matter, right? In life or in church, you know, the old joke, you know, the color of the carpet, or or where we park, or you know, the, you know, whatever. You know, small things that aren't at the core of the gospel. But but listen, to what Paul says: I don't care what you believe, or what you prefer, or think, because it ain't about you, Skippy. Not about me. What matters is that God has revealed himself since the dawn of creation, and it can be plainly seen everywhere you look. As humans, though, we sure can muddy those waters, can't we? We try and explain God in so many ways when what we're often doing is trying to make him fit into what makes us comfortable and what we want. Instead of what is written in his word and is clearly revealed right there and in the world around us. This true revelation is something worth being thankful for. God doesn't depend on our opinions to define who he is. He is so much bigger than that. I'm thankful. Because everyone seems to be a Christian until it gets biblical. Surely we can, we can say, or we will say, I'm thankful when we see this. Number five, watch, when we see the resemblance. Look at verse 21. Listen to this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give 
thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You know what? As we see here, as Paul's writing, and remember we point out all the time on, on purpose, he's writing to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we realize that for generations, not, not just recently, but for generations, mankind has tried to put images and things in the place that God should be. And think about it. We, we, we see it in the Garden of Eden. We see it with the children of Israel in the wilderness. We, we, it can be seen today all around our culture, in our families. Sadly, it's even crept into our churches. And it's quite simply idolatry. And you know what idolatry is, right? It's placing anything or anyone in the place in our life that should only be held by God himself. But when you think about it, that futile attempt at resembling God should actually make us thankful because it reminds us, it reminds you, it reminds me of something that we so often forget. While it is sad that so many people try and put things in their life that they think is God, their need, their desire to do so reminds us that we are actually created for Him and His purposes. And if we would only realize that and surrender our heart and life to Christ, the one true God, we would see once and for all that we are created in His image. And that the only way to live up to it is to accept the free gift of salvation and begin the wonderful adventure of living for Jesus. That's something to be thankful for. Because everybody's a Christian until it gets biblical. Surely we'll say I'm thankful when we see this. Watch number six, last. We see the repercussion. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, now hang on. You're telling me I should be thankful for the repercussions of sin? Or I should be thankful for how people act against God and His Word? R remember, we said earlier, it's all about perspective and, and how, we, how we choose to look at things. Paul is reminding them, he's reminding us that there's a price to pay if we don't realize or we don't give God his proper place in our life. I mean, you can choose if you're going to follow God and his word or not. You can choose to live however you want. You can fall prey to what the seeming majority say are acceptable lifestyles or choices. That also includes being in church and just pretending, by the way. But there's a price to pay if any of that is your choice. So, why be thankful for that? We should be thankful for the reminder of the price there is to pay. Why, though? Because it keeps us motivated to tell everyone we come in contact with about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, our job is not done. As long as there's breath in our lungs, as long as Jesus has not returned, we aren't done telling people about Him and how they can be right with Him. 
And if nothing else, that's why we should be able to say, I am thankful. Because everyone seems to be a Christian until it gets biblical. So what does all that mean? You know, I'm thankful that the free gift of God, that gift of salvation, that it requires nothing from us other than acceptance of the gift. You have to admit you're a sinner. You have to realize that. You have to believe that Jesus died on a cross, that God rose him from the dead, and confess with your mouth. And even further, that God has provided his infallible, inspired word so that so we'd have a, a guide in how to honor him and follow him. And, and how to live our lives in such a way that others will want to follow him as well. And I, I'm thankful that even in the rough waters of, of life and the world, that our God is faithful to show us his word and just how amazing it is to live for him. I am thankful that his word provides a reminder that explains that even if the world has lost their ever-loving minds, and living however they choose, that God's plan will reign supreme. I'm thankful. Aren't you? Let's pray. God, thank you. We well, thank you that we can not only know you, but we can be known by you. Lord, here's, here's our two requests. In, in, in this room today, gathering online, watching later, there's two, there, there's two types of folks. There's those who, who they've never come to the point where they've realized their need for you. They've never admitted they're a sinner. They've never believed that you died on a cross, that you rose from the dead. They've never confessed that. They're not a Christian. So what we ask is you convict their hearts, that you break their hearts, that they don't go another moment without realizing their need to accept your gift of salvation, and that they do that right now. And then, Lord, the second group, believers, followers, Christians, but those of us, maybe we've lost sight of the thankfulness, the mission, what's important. Lord, I pray that you'll break our hearts, bring us back to where we need to be on mission for you. Over the next few moments as we sing, as we worship, the altar's open. Please draw us to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.